You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andre. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have Ruven Lerner. He for two decades has been teaching Python to companies around the world. He works regularly with engineers in the US, Europe, Israel, India and China, helping them accomplish more with less code. Plus, he has a PhD in learning sciences. Hi, Ruven. How are you? Hi, doing great. Thanks, Andre, for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure to having you on. Uh, do you want to add anything else to your introduction? Uh, look, I've had a long sort of journey in getting to where I am now in terms of training. Um, I wasn't okay. always doing training, but now that's really like what I concentrate on. And um, so while sort of day to day I'm doing corporate training, I'm also increasingly going to online stuff, uh, whether it's online video training or exercises or books, trying to sort of reach as many people as possible to help them with their careers awesome. and uh, Im- improve their their ability to do what they do their jobs. That sounds really good, and um, we'll put some links in your in the show notes so people who are interested in Python or want to pick it up, they can go there and do it. That's really awesome. good. Um, with what would you like? What's your cup of tea? Do you want to start with the success or the failure story? Which one would be? Uh, <laughs> let's let's start with the success. Then we can we can we can butter people up. <laughs> okay, okay, Ruben. Let's start with the success. So, what would be the biggest leadership success story you've witnessed personally? Look, so I'll I'll divide that into two parts. In terms of biggest leadership success I've seen, I've witnessed, it wasn't actually me doing any sort of leadership. But when I was was first starting off, I I worked at HP, and then I worked at Time Warner. And in each case there, we had a manager come in. And I thought, okay, a manager, like, it doesn't really matter who it is, right? Someone's going to tell me what to do. (laughs) And in both cases, I was blown away by how much one person's leadership, tone, caring for their employees um, really shone through and and was such a stark contrast with managers that I'd had before, let's say when I was in university and working part-time jobs or summer jobs. Um, They really tried to make us feel part of a team, that our team could succeed, that each and every one of us uh, was invested in the success. And also when things weren't going so well, that, uh, that, that we all wanted to work together. So when it came time for me to pull together a bunch of people and start working in my own company, I tried as much as possible to to sort of emulate what they had done. I would thank people for what they were Mm -hmm. doing. I would ask what I could do to sort of remove any roadblocks. And I really sort of, it was ingrained in me to have this leadership philosophy of um, don't tell your employees what to do, especially in high tech, have good people, tell them what the goal is, stand out, get out of their way and try to remove the roadblocks. So, I mean, in, in terms of like big projects that I worked on, we had this one really, really cool project a number of years ago where it okay. required... Do tell. Yeah, yeah. Like we had, I mean, we worked on, we worked on a few projects. Let me just like silence my phone here so it doesn't bother us for the rest of the recording. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so we, we had this project where a company came to us and this was... Uh, when the Human Genome Project, sort of exploring genes and trying to figure it out, Ooh. was just either like finishing up or had some information. And this was a company that was trying to make it possible, sort of navigate through the gene. Like you could use your web browser, sort of move forward or backward and scroll through the genes and get information about it. It was That's really so cool. incredibly cool. Oh my God, it was like the coolest project. Yeah. So we had like two or three people from my team working on it. Like I at that point had five or six people working for me. By the way, this will lead into the failure story later on. But I had two had <laughs> okay, a bunch of people okay. working for me. And um, I had, I think, two of them working on this project, maybe three. And I was also helping out. We were meeting them regularly, and they were there. Um, and at a certain point, and, and they, the, the client, had a bunch of people working on the project as well. Um, and overall, really, it was a smashing success. We got the project out. It worked really great. But, you know, along the, along the way, there were some uh, uh, frictions. And so uh, one of the issues was that their team was saying, your team like, isn't communicating enough. Your team isn't doing enough. And my team would say, <laughs> we're waiting for you. Like each team said that we're waiting for the other one. Yeah, blaming All each right? other. Like, 
Exactly, exactly. So in, in what I would definitely say is one of my great management success stories, I said, tell you what, folks, I say, and I know this is going to sound like obvious nowadays, we should just use a bug tracker. And then we will know exactly uh-huh. which bugs have been filed when by whom. And you didn't have to point fingers because it was very obvious from the timestamps in the bug tracker who had filed what when and who was <laughs> yes. slacking off and who wasn't. And within days of installing this, the complaints stopped completely and the thing started to flow once again without any pointed fingers. Um, and in many ways, I see this as a great success story because we managed to get the project out, yes, but we managed to do it without people killing each other and, and hating each other. And you didn't have to go in and be super explicit about, now children, you all need to behave. But rather, just by changing <laughs> some small part of the infrastructure, you change their behavior so that it was uh, more in tune with what the project needed. No, I find this really interesting that just adding an extra layer of transparency actually solves the, the friction issues. It's really cool. It was amazing. It was amazing. I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was really... And, and I'll tell you, look, the high-tech world is a small one, um, especially a country like yes. Israel where everyone sort of knows each other. And so about six months ago, a company contacted me and said, we'd like you to come in and do some Python training. I said, great, and while I was there, I was chatting with them. I said, so tell me, how did you get in touch with me? They said, oh, 20 years ago, when you worked on this project, at like the one that I just described, the DNA <laughs> gene yes. project, there was a guy working there who really liked you, and he saw that you were doing Python training now, and he wanted to call you back. So these connections and impressions that you make on people without even realizing it can affect you far, far, far later on. So it's good to be nice to people and on, on good behavior, uh, even in stressful times. Oh, Ruben, you're so right. Like, even globally, the IT scene is not that that big. It's really That's easy right. to forge a name for you, and you can make it positive or you can make it negative. Um, especially right. if you want to have, like, a, one of those uh, shooting star careers and really grow and do something amazing with your career, then you have to be more strategic about what you do and make sure you, you leave a positive uh, image behind you. Absolutely, absolutely. And I like I like um, the fact that you learn from uh, from your, the pre- the good managers you had before at HP and Warner, and especially you, you took the lesson of removing roadblocks and how. Uh, it's really right, good. and, and, and I'll, it's I'll even it's say important. like, look, I'll say like my, my my wife is not in high tech at all. She's a, a curator at a gallery that's part of a larger nonprofit. And they've been having, uh, thanks to the whole uh, coronavirus thing, you know, everyone's having financial issues and management issues and so forth. Yes. And we've been talking about like their management and how it is and is not working effectively. And so sort of, I've been able to bring up some of these examples of what I learned uh, with, with her as well. And you know, we've been able to brainstorm about what she can and should do um, with, with the other awesome. staff. Um, ho- hopefully it'll work out well. <laughs> <laughs> I do well as well. Uh, management and leadership is it's mostly the same in all fields. It's, it's uh, the more I talk to people, the more I feel like it's it's an ingrained humane human skill that you have to have, and you have it even if you want or not. Because in any if there are more than two people or just two people, one is going to be more of a leader, one is going to be more of a follower, and then they, it can shift and change depending on the circumstance, but it's always this dynamic. So everybody has something to say about it because you experience it on a daily basis. Yes, yes, very true. Very true. And with that in mind, and you said like uh, your success story segues into the... <laughs> the failure so look, one. So I'll tell you. For, first of all, I remember when I started my company um, and I had some issue with a client and my accountant at the time said, boy, if I had all the money that I lost due to mistakes and failures, I would be an extremely rich man. And you know what? Um, <laughs> same here. Same here. Same here. Like that's, it, it, it's unfortunate, but everyone sort of has to learn certain lessons the hard way and the long way. Um, and you know, we can try to teach each other and we can certainly, certainly have gaining sense from others. And so among my many mistakes was um, not understanding the sort of person I was and the sort of business I wanted to run. 
So as I like to tell people, when I first started my consulting company, I got to Israel in 1995 from the US. I, I decided right away to start consulting. I actually started consulting for Time Warner. And you could think of them as sort of like the investors in my consulting business. So I was able to grow it. And then as I mentioned, um, I had about oh. five, six people working for me. And I had this vision of the learner consulting towers you know, rising high over this, you know, this, the skyscrapers of Moldeim, um, like that we could see the, the, the Mediterranean from here. And then in the year 2000, um, the bottom dropped out of everything, right? There was this whole yes. dot-com implosion, massive recession worldwide. And instead of the phone ringing off the hook nonstop, uh, the, <laughs> with new clients and new things to do, the phone was ringing off the hook nonstop with clients saying, either we're not gonna be paying or we don't want your people anymore, or we don't want projects anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very, very difficult, and I had to start laying people off. So first of all, I discovered what were the sorts of people I wanted to hire and fire, like what were those people I should have hired originally, that some of my staff um, might have been technically very astute, but they weren't easy to work with, not for me and certainly not for my clients. And so I realized, okay, like if I'm laying them off now, they're clearly the first ones to go, but in the future, I'm not gonna hire people like that again. Um, I also realized that while I love the idea of helping people, teaching people, mentoring people, hiring students, not a good idea. Uh, be, just because of sort of the, the kind of work that I do and the way that I work. Um, hiring students is generally a great thing, but it's not appropriate for everyone. And then we really were in pretty dire financial straits, truth be told, because I had to pay all these salaries. I'd rented an office, I had all these expenses. It was very, very hard. Um, and in the face of that, I had to like, be decent to my, my employees, the remaining ones lay them off nicely, pay salaries, benefits, and everything. So first of all, um, like that taught me a lot about how I want to structure my company, that I'm not interested in having a huge consulting company. I'll have a small one, and nowadays, truth be told, it's just me, and I'm very happy doing the training on my own, and I don't even have any interest in having other people work for me. But it took that sort of crisis to teach that, me that lesson. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, sort of considering, uh, you have to, again, be nice to people. I could have, um, if I really wanted to be a, you know, a jerk about it, I could have said to my employees, well, we haven't been paid by these companies, and so I'm not going to pay you until I get paid by them. Um, no. But that's not what I did in the end. Uh, I, you know, I paid them, and I sort of you know, dealt with the banks and so forth. And looking back, I'm really proud of how I, I, I did that. Uh, but it wasn't always easy, and I wasn't always uh, doing the right thing, and I wasn't always um, sort of negotiating things among my employees in the right way. But again, these are things you sort of have to learn, have to learn over time. Um, yeah, and, like, and I'll even say, like, there was one guy who I kept on, like the final employee okay. I kept on, uh, who just sort of disappeared one day. Um, and it is like, weird. Yeah, like, 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 I mean, not like disappeared, like kidnapped or something, but like he didn't show up to work. And my clients, I was abroad at the time, my clients called and said, where is he? What's going on with him? And I didn't know, I was abroad. Uh, so in the end, like he just sort of mysteriously left my office. He sent a friend to like pick up his stuff. And uh, the irony is that 20 years later, we're actually in touch again. And we're having, good, we have a good relationship. So uh, even though then I would have counted nice. as like this weird, weird management failure of like, what did I do to deserve <laughs> this sort of favor from this guy? Um, you know, time heals all wounds. And so we seem to be doing okay now. Um, and I, I think overall then, one big lesson I've learned is even when things look like they're terrible, even when things feel horrible, you can still get lessons from them and you can still then apply those lessons in the future. And having that sense of it's not the end, things will get better, you can learn from this uh, is an important attitude to have throughout, whether you're dealing with people or just running your business in general. Yeah. And actually when you, you have to do take tough choices and make tough choices, that's when you actually, which are either direction you go, it's, it's not going to be great. You realize it's not going to be great. That's when you have like the opportunity to grow and learn all kinds of things about yourself and about the world and about business in general, because business, it's not always nice. It's not uh, always smooth and <laughs> rising up and uh, ending up on the top of the world. It's, it's more in ebbs and flows. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with all your experience, what would be your leadership philosophy? It's like I said before, get like find. So, so years ago, years ago, I'll, I'll sort of expand on this. 
yeah, there's this guy named Guy Kawasaki, who was one of the original people working on the Macintosh team. And he's written all sorts yes. of books about leadership and so forth. And one of the things he wrote, which has really stuck with me, is that A players hire A players and B players hire C players. Mm -hmm. So if you're really good, you should hire really good people. Don't be afraid of your staff. You want to hire people who will be better than you at doing what they do, who can like, you know, so I was maybe managing programmers, but I wasn't doing day-to-day -day programming. So I should have found people who are amazing developers. And if they were better than I was, that was okay. And then nurture them, help them, help them to learn, help them to grow, encourage them to read, take courses, go to conferences, because they will appreciate it. Um, I had an employee recently who's approached, he told me after the fact, multiple times by other companies to go work for them. And he said, no, I am enjoying my work so much more with Ruben because of how he treats me. I don't want to change, even though they would have given him a better salary. Um, I mean, I don't think he was just saying this to like make me feel good, yeah. although it did make me feel good. But if you treat your employees well and decently and honestly, it, it will reward you and your company as much as it helps them. Oh, that's for sure. And that's that's one thing that uh, it's it's common and unfortunate is like because you come from uh, from developing or doing the stuff, and then you get promoted to management, and then you have to take your um, personality and your ego out of it and not be envious of somebody that might be better at, at it than you were, ever were. And learn from them. It's a learn tough it's, step, yes. It's, it's, it shouldn't be embarrassing to learn from your employees. Like we always have, I certainly long had this view that the manager is like, has to be the smartest, the best at everything. Right. And so like whoever's under them has tough, to be tough job. Worse. That's a tough job, but that's impossible. Right. That's not just, like, <laughs> especially nowadays. Like, so, so you're more like the orchestra leader, you're right. Like a conductor where you're not going to be the best violinist, the best pianist, the best everything, but you can bring everyone's skills to the forefront and you can help them shine in doing their thing and contribute to the whole. Yeah. And you know a little about each piece so you can, you can see bottlenecks and what you, what you can help them and understand their, their problems. So you're not, there also can be like on the other, other part, you can be so clueless as a manager. You don't know exactly how, <laughs> how the pie gets baked <laughs> and then have all kinds of wild expectations. So, Two things on that front. First of all, uh, I remember there was a Dilbert cartoon years and years and years ago where like, they pointed out that the less you know about something, the, like, the, the easier it is, I put easier in quotes there, to estimate how long it'll take, <laughs> right? So, so like, you know, if, if you don't know how long it takes to write software, then you'll say, oh, this should only take a week. And I've certainly had clients over the years say to me, oh, like, you know, this is only a week's worth of work, right? It looks just like such other sites. Just copy what they do and it should be easy. And they don't understand the intricacies oh. of the, the work that's involved at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so uh, there's something else I want to say. I can't remember what it is right now. But, uh, but, but, but yeah. Oh, I know. I know what it is. So um, I teach this okay. class uh, that I call Python for Non-Programmers uh, at a bunch of different companies. And it's really, like, designed for people who, well, as the name says, like, don't have a programming background. Or very often people who took a programming class in university hated it, were convinced that they could not do it. And yet they end up in a high tech company managing a group of programmers. So many times yeah. people in this class say, I want to understand exactly as you said, like I want to understand what my employees are doing. I want to have a better handle on it just so I can better appreciate what it is uh, that they're up to. And when they use certain lingo, I'll be able to talk with them more easily. And they come out of the course saying, Hey, yeah, what do you know? Like this, this is great. I can actually, <laughs> so that's what they were talking about. <laughs> 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 also, a better appreciation for the difficulty. Like, you know, if you realize all the different if-then statements you need just for, like, user input, suddenly when someone fails to strip white space from the beginning of an email address, you're a little more understanding oh, of yeah. how you can make that kind of mistake. Exactly. And it's good. It's good that some managers are willing to put in the time and the effort to learn about the stuff that they're managing. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. And um, it's, it's a credit, I think, to their companies that are willing to allow them to do that as well. Because there's so many stingy yeah. companies out there where they're like, oh, no, you can, you can learn this on your own. We'll get you a book, but take you out of, <laughs> out of work for four days. Are you crazy? No, no, no. It's, it's like, it's great. It's great. Uh, I mean, good for me, but yeah, also good for that's, them. <laughs> that's also a truth of the world. So what, since we're talking like people who want to improve themselves and especially uh, new people in um, aspiring leaders, let's say, what would be your top three leadership tips you have for them? 
Oh my God. Uh, bah, 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 bah. So first of all, um, so get out of the way, right? Leadership is get out of the way, let, let them shine, let them do their thing. I guess I've repeated that enough. Number two is never stop learning. Right, if, if, if you, like, I don't think it's only in high tech, but we certainly have it in high tech, that because yes. things are changing so quickly, you have to have the attitude of, I'm always gonna have to learn, whatever I learn now will help me in the future, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient, shall we say, for the future. So constantly be reading, constantly be watching, constantly be taking classes, and that allow you to feel like you're not falling behind too much. It'll also give you insights into what your company can do, what your division can do, what your team can do, what you can do, both technologically and organizationally. And I would say the third tip is learn things that are not high tech. You would be amazed by the insights you can get. So my, as my friends know, my obsession is learning Chinese. I've been doing that for a few years now. And the oh. number of insights it has given me into language, people, culture, teaching, learning has been immense. Um, it is really, it, it's as much I see as like a professional development thing uh, for me, because the number of lessons that I get as a Chinese learner, um, then that I, when I apply in my own training work as a teacher, uh, huge, huge number of, of lessons there. Uh, and that's the, actually number three. It's a really good tip. And it's something that I try to instill, like, especially like for developers and said, look, if you went to college and you learn how to be a computer scientist and then you went straight to work and all you did until now is just program you don't have and you don't have experience about how business gets managed if you're writing business management software or whatever software you're you're writing it's your passion you should also strive to get involved with that field and find out how it works, how people do their jobs, uh, what is happening there, what what are they studying, what are their desires. It's not just about knowing your craft and honing your skills. It's also getting a worldly view because that's what you're doing as a as a computer scientist. You're, you're trying to take something that already exists and model it uh, inside the computer. And this, that's, that's right. my view of that's it. Right. That's right. But if, 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 and if you don't understand the real world version, how are you possibly going to? Yeah, like, how can I mean, if, if you had to design a hammer, but you had never seen a carpenter before and you had never built anything before, exactly. how would you know what's necessary? It would be very hard, right? Uh, of course, for me, using a hammer even now is hard, but that's, that's why I'm a software guy. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Just get some experience with it. You don't have to become a master of the hammer. <laughs> And since you talked like in uh, tip number two about continuous learning, what is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Oh my God. Wow. The book. So I, I will give you a few books that have influenced me. Okay. And I'm sure that's that like, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that I'm missing like a good number of them. Um, so one of the first books about business that I read that a really profound influence on me was called The Machine That Changed the World. Um, and it was all about just-in-time um, production and development. And this was probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago that I read it. And it was fascinating for me to see how manufacturing had changed and how the world has sort of caught up with it. And I would add, we're now sort of suffering the ill effects of that. that because all warehouses, all production is just-in-time, the fact that there were supply chain issues now, thanks to the coronavirus... Yeah. Now we're sort of stuck with it, but, but it's only because I started reading that years ago that it was able to give me the perspective and understanding of, uh oh, this is what's going to go on. Um, a second one that I, I, I bought 20 years ago, but I'm only reading, I'm finishing reading now, is Guns, Germs, okay. and Steel um, by Jared Guns, Diamond. Guns, Germs, and Steel. Okay. Amazing, amazing book. And he basically asks the question, um, why are certain societies poor or certain areas of the world poor and why are certain ones rich? He says it basically is because of what happened in those places 10,000, 20,000 years ago. Um, and that these geographical okay. issues led to cultural issues. The cultural issues led to political and technological issues. And then that sort of, uh, you know, played itself out. And I see now, again, these ripples through everything I've learned and everything I've dealt with uh, over the years that have really sort of been, been interesting. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, I know that there, oh, and, and I'll give a, a, a nerd book as well. Uh, Structure and okay. Interpretation of Computer Programs. So, oh, yeah. 
So I, I went to MIT undergrad, and that was our intro computer science course taught by the people who wrote the book. And it was a fun course. It was a very hard course, but I didn't understand how profound the ideas were until years and years later that they were really teaching us. And they even said this to us. They said, look, uh, so just so you know, like at MIT, you don't learn the C language. Uh, if you want to learn C, you have to go to the mechanical engineering or civil engineering department. They offer C because okay. computer science people are like, oh, we wouldn't be caught dead using a language like that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sneering at them. So we learned Lisp. Nowadays, they actually teach the course in Python, which is a, a, a nice irony for me. But toward the end of the course, they said, okay, we know what's going to happen. You're going to go get jobs. And they're not going to be using Lisp or Scheme as they used in the book. They're going to use another language. But it doesn't matter. We've taught you now the underlying principles that you can go and learn any new programming language and apply them. And that has affected me in both my thinking. Oh, I can learn a new programming language. Maybe it gives me like an extra sense of haughtiness, right? Oh, I can learn anything. But it oh. also means that when I go to teach, I try to teach the underlying principles that pull things together so that people will see all the language, Python in this case nowadays for me, as part of a greater whole and a consistent design rather than as just, oh, I'll try this and try this and try this. Oh, you know, I'm going to need one more book, one more book, because okay, I just read more. it, and it is so stunningly good. So um, it's called The Passion Economy by Adam Davidson. Everyone, oh, everyone yes. in business should read this book. Oh, my God. And I'm not just saying this, sucking up to him, because I'm interviewing him tomorrow night on my podcast. Um, <laughs> I'm, saying, I, I'm so giddy because I'm getting get a chance to talk to him. So... He's been a, a business and economics reporter for 20, 30 years now or so, working for National Public Radio and the New York Times and the New Yorker. He writes beautifully and brilliantly. He's been doing podcasting, but he basically set out to find out what makes businesses succeed and what makes them fail. And he talked, and, and, and he, he's decided that um, what he calls the passion economy, that nowadays, if you want to succeed, you should be, you should sort of define your own niche, define something that makes you unusual. Opening up a bakery, Anyone can open a bakery, but opening a bakery yeah. that's special in this way, that specializes a certain kind of bread or a certain kind of pastry, that's going to make you stand out. And if you're passionate about uh, really perfecting your craft, being like the biggest fish in the smallest pond, you could really do very well for yourself. I, 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 it was such a patron for me. And the, the funny thing was, I got about three quarters of the way through the book, and he mentions an ice cream shop in New York. And, I, and he says how their ice cream is like the best ever. You wouldn't believe it. And I turned to my daughter and wife and I said, where was that ice cream shop that you said you went to in New York last summer when you were visiting there? And they told me and it was exactly the same place. Like they indeed said, this Aww. place really is better than everywhere else. <laughs> so people should read this book. It's like, it's an easy read, but it's, it's mind blowing. Fantastic. That's great. And Ruven, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? So uh, the sort of uh, most central place to find out about my stuff is my website, learner.co.il. That's L-E-R-N-E-R.co.il. And that has links to my blog, my newsletter, my, uh, which is my mailing list, my courses, and so forth. Um, I'm also on Twitter fairly often. Um, we'll put a link there, Reuven M. Lerner. And I'm on LinkedIn sometime. I mean, I'm there a lot, even if I, I don't necessarily post very much. But I would be very, very happy to hear from people uh, with questions, comments, uh, thoughts. It's always my pleasure to hear from people around the world. Yeah, and if you're interested in, in Python, reach out to Ruven. He's going to hook you up and uh, get you to speed faster than ever, especially because he goes for the essence of uh, the language and not just uh, the fluff. Thank you. Yes. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, Ruven. Thank you very much. My great pleasure, Andre. Thanks again. That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe and share please. Oh, you can find further info and materials in the show notes on techleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.